Welcome back. This is chapter 12 on surveying the stars. Very important chapter to look at. So for the first part here, our goals for learning are how do we measure the stellar luminosities or brightnesses, their temperatures, and the stellar masses. How do we measure stellar luminosity or brightness? Brightness of a star depends on both the distance and the luminosity. Luminosity pretty much means the intrinsic brightness of the star, no matter how far away it is. How bright is it really? The luminosity is defined as amount of power a star radiates energy per second, and that's in a unit called watts. The apparent brightness, however, is the amount of starlight that is received at the Earth difference. Now as the starlight passes through the star and through space, it decreases its brightness by an inverse square relationship. And what that means is if you are twice as far away from the star, the star is then four times fainter. If you go three times farther away than from the star, then you will be receiving that light nine times fainter. So it's an inverse squared relationship. The most luminous stars are about a million times as luminous as the sun. The least luminous stars are pretty dim. Well, how do we measure stellar temperatures? We can take a spectrum of the star which is what most of astronomy these days is, is taking spectra. This is used when your telescope has a device called a spectrograph on it. It's either a diffraction grating or a prism that breaks up the starlight into its rainbow colors. And so we have seven types of spectra in the visible spectrum, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Now every object emits thermal radiation with a spectrum that depends on its temperature. Object of, an object of fixed size grows more luminous as its temperature increases. So as it gets hotter and hotter, it becomes brighter and brighter. Okay. Hotter objects emit more light per unit area at all frequencies. And hotter objects emit photons with a higher average energy. So the hottest stars are 50,000 Kelvin. Coolest stars are 3,000 Kelvin, and to compare that with the sun, the sun's surface is 5,800 Kelvin. Now, here's a spectra of the sun, and the absorption lines, the dark lines you see, in this star spectrum tells us its ionization level, kind of a nuclear physics thing, to atoms. So, these lines in the visible spectrum correspond to a spectral type that reveals its temperature. And you have got to learn this. These are the seven categories that we put stars into. The hottest stars begin with an O, goes down to O, B, A, F, G, K, and M are the coolest stars. And you will need to memorize this. But we have a cool way of doing that. We have this mnemonic phrase, O, be a fine girl or guy, Kiss me. That's pretty simple. If you know that, you've got the whole thing down. Well, who are the ones who did all this work? They were actually women at Harvard. Annie Jump Cannon and her 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 pals, the calculators at Harvard, laid down the foundation of modern stellar classification. Now, how do we measure the stellar masses? We use eclipsing binary stars, and this is what my research is in, primarily. As the two stars orbit each other, one of them will go in front, like a lunar or solar eclipse, but now we have two stars going in front of each other, and they cause a dip. And this graph here is called a light curve, and the dips in the light means less light being received through the telescope. The orbit of a binary star depends on the strength of gravity. And there are three types of binary star systems. The visual binary, where you can see two stars through the telescope. And eclipsing binary and a spectroscopic binary. The spectroscopic binaries cannot be resolved in a telescope unless you take a spectra of them. And then you see two various different dark lines. 
and about half of all the stars in the universe are in binary systems. They have a visual binary, and we can see the two stars orbiting each other over time. The eclipsing binary is when we measure periodic eclipses, like I told you about before, and this is my research. And the spectroscopic binary, where the two stars are so close, we have to use a spectrum to resolve them, and we see the differences in the lines. Now, when a star is moving away from us, these lines move towards the red side, called redshifted. When the star is moving towards us, the lines move towards the blue side, and that's called a blue shift. Now, don't worry about this equation here, just to point out this is how we measure mass with gravity. Direct mass measurements are possible only for stars in binary systems. So, an eclipsing binary star is the best way we have to measure a star's mass. And you can see here the mass of one star plus the mass of another star, with gravity thrown in, size of orbit, and the period of the orbit, how long it takes to orbit. All that put together, we can figure it out. So the most massive stars are about 100 times massive than the sun. Those are very rare. The least massive stars are at a critical low mass of 0.08 solar masses. And uh, this M sun means mass of the sun. And so my research uh, most recently was on these this lower end red dwarf eclipsing binary stars so we learned that if we measure a star's apparent brightness and distance we can compute its luminosity with the inverse square law for light a star's color and spectra type both reflect its temperature and Newton's version of Kepler's third law that we saw a few weeks ago tells us the total mass of a binary system if we can measure its orbital period and average separation of the system in the orbit. Okay, now this is a very critical part of this lesson. The Hirschsprung-Russell diagram and the significance of what we call the main sequence and what are giants, supergiants, and white dwarfs. You will probably want to rewind this video to capture all the information I'm going to give you here in the next five minutes. So here is the Hirschsprung-Russell diagram, also called the HR diagram for short. And I'm going to point out some key areas here for you. White dwarfs are these, this area down here. These are faint but hot white small stars. We have very large hot stars the blue supergiants and cooler stars that are super big, the red supergiants. We have smaller but still big stars here, the giants. But along this curved path here in the middle is what we call the main sequence. And this is the normal stars. Normal stars meaning they have hydrogen fusion going on inside the core of it. And here's the sun right here. As our diagram plots the luminosity up and down and the temperatures of the stars by spectral type or temperature left to right. The hotter stars are to the left, the brighter stars are to the top. Most stars fall somewhere on the main sequence of the HR diagram. Again, these are the normal stars. And the stars I researched were way down here, the red, dwarf stars, eclipsing binary stars, the M stars. So, stars with a lower temperature and a higher luminosity must have bigger radii, the giants and supergiants. The stars with higher temperatures but lower luminosities than the main sequence stars must be smaller, the white dwarfs. Okay, we can also classify it using spectrotype and luminosity class. So luminosity classes are one through five, supergiant, bright giant, giant, subgiant, and main sequence is Greek number five. So for example, the sun is a G2 star with a V as main sequence. 
the two is just a, a subcategory of G stars. You can have G1, G2, G3, all the way to G9, just subclasses of that general classification of G stars, which are kind of cool stars. So the HR diagram protects the temperature, the color, the spectrotype, luminosity, and the radius. So let's take a little quiz here. Looking at this, which star do you think is the hottest? White dwarfs, blue supergiants, red supergiants, main sequence stars. Which star is the hottest? It is A. More to the left means the hotter star. Which star is the most luminous? Remember, luminosity goes up, so we would expect it to be C. Which star is a main sequence star? Well, those are the ones here in the middle of the curve. Probably going to be D. And it is. Which star has the largest radius? Okay. Let's take a look at these lines going diagonally here. This line is 10 to the minus third solar radii. That's uh, less than a thousandth of the solar radius. The sun is here, one solar radii. And these stars up here can be up to a hundred or more solar radii, or a thousand solar radii. So which star is the largest radius? It's going to be C, this red supergiant. What is the significance of the main sequence then? Main sequence stars are fusing hydrogen into helium in their course, just like the sun. Luminous main sequence stars are hot, they're blue, and the less luminous ones are cooler, yellow, or red. Mass measurements of main sequence stars show that the hot blue stars are much more massive than the cool red ones. So mass goes diagonally the other way, from lower right to upper left. So these stars here are less than one-tenth the mass of the sun. We have the sun here in the middle. And then as we go up here, these blue supergiants, you can get to 30 or 60 or even more solar masses. But these are very rare. It's kind of like a watermelon. You have the whole watermelon here, 30 solar masses. You have a watermelon ball you might eat. Uh, here's the sun. And then the seeds are these lower mass stars. And then droplets of the juice out of the watermelon are these red dwarf stars. That's why I always remember that. The mass of a normal hydrogen fusing star determines its luminosity and its spectrotype. Okay, the mass and lifetime of the sun, 10 billion years expectancy, and we're halfway through that. Now, the more massive stars use up the fuel faster. So low mass stars could live to be, theoretically, a trillion years. High mass stars might only live to be 10 million years. And the sun, again, is at 10 billion years. Okay, what are the giants, supergiants, and white dwarfs? These are off the main sequence. Stellar properties depend on both mass and age, and those that have finished fusing hydrogen and helium in the cores are no longer on the main sequence. All stars become larger and redder after exhausting their core hydrogen, giants and supergiants, and most stars end up small and white after the fusion has ceased, and these are the white dwarfs. Those are dead stars. So back on the HR diagram, which star is most like our sun? That's going to be D. Which of these stars will have changed at least 10 billion years from now? That's going to be A, the white dwarfs, the dead stars. They've used up their hydrogen fusion and they're dead. They're just cooling off. So an HR diagram plots the stellar luminosity of stars versus the surface temperature or color or spectral type. The significance of the main sequence is that normal stars that fuse hydrogen to helium in their cores fall on the main sequence of an HR diagram. And a star's mass determines its position along the main sequence, the high mass luminous and blue stars, low mass of the faint and red stars. All stars become larger and redder after core hydrogen is exhausted, and these are the giants and supergiants. And then once the fusion has ceased and they are dead, these stars end up as tiny white dwarfs.
Okay. Switch gears now to look at star clusters. What are the two types of star clusters and how do we measure the age of a star cluster? Again, here's Annie Jump Cannon and her friends at Harvard. They classified over a half a million stars in their catalog. An open cluster are a few thousand loosely packed stars. This is actually the Pleiades or the uh, Seven Sisters. You can see these in the sky. A globular cluster is up to a million or more stars in a dense ball bound together by gravity. And this is very dense and many stars, very old cluster. So how do we measure the age of a star cluster? We have to look at where these stars turn off the main sequence, called the main sequence turnoff. The Pleiades now have no stars with a life expectancy less than 100 million years. The main sequence turnoff point of a cluster tells us its age. And so these stars here are going to be older than these stars up here where they turn off the main sequence. So to determine the accurate ages, we compare models of stellar evolution to the cluster data. And this is an ongoing thing all the time. So the detailed modeling of the oldest globular clusters reveals that they are about 13 billion years old. And this is what a globular cluster would look like on the HR diagram. They would turn off right here. So we have open clusters that are loosely packed contain a few thousand stars. Globular clusters are densely packed and contain hundreds or thousands of stars. 